Welcome back to this continuing discussion of the ISLM model, where we're going to revisit a topic we talked about earlier when we studied the Keynesian cross model. So let's review that concept. It's the concept of the G multiplier, the government purchases multiplier. So the idea with the Keynesian cross was that for each dollar increase in government spending, we know this would lead to higher planned expenditure and then ultimately higher actual spending in equilibrium. But we found that it wasn't like for each dollar more you spent, you would get one dollar more of output. It tended to actually be for every dollar increase in government purchases, you would get a two or three or maybe even more increase in output. And we called this idea the G multiplier. So we define the G multiplier as the change in output per change in government spending. And we found a simple formula, which I've copied down here for that G multiplier. It was 1 over 1 minus MPC. So in particular, if the MPC was really small, like 0.1, then this formula would give us, or sorry, it was really high, like 0.9, then this formula would tell us it was 1, the, the G multiplier was 1 over 1 minus 0.9, which you can do the math on a calculator, uh, would, would give us 10. So under certain circumstances, the G multiplier might be quite large. It might be you only need to spend $1 to get a $10 increase in output. So that's quite a lot of bang for your buck. We want to revisit this concept in the ISLM model because it turns out that this simple, uh, the Keynesian cross multiplier formula is really way oversimplified. Uh, we will still have this sort of notion of a G multiplier in the ISLM model. We'll be able to calculate it based on the formula in blue above. It'll be delta Y over delta G. But there won't be a simple formula, and it'll turn out to usually be smaller than the Keynesian cross G multiplier would predict. And I think working through this, you might say, what's the point of working through this? It sounds like it's complicated and we won't get any final conclusions. And, and that's true. That's a fair criticism. But it's a really helpful illustration of a really important policy application we can do with ISLM. And it also helps to illustrate what makes ISLM different than the Keynesian cross. What does the ISLM model capture that the Keynesian cross left out? And that'll, you know, give us a little bit of um, reward for all the, all the work we've done developing this model. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Our starting point will be to build from scratch uh, our IS and LM model for a specific example. So the specific example is we have G unknown, mostly because we want to understand how changes in G would increase uh, in output, right? We want to calculate the G multiplier. For simplicity, we'll have no taxes, so T is zero. We'll have a pretty simple investment function. It's 15 minus R. And we'll have a pretty simple consumption function. It's 10 plus 0.5 times disposable income. And of course, T is zero, so disposable income is just uh, income. And then we have sort of a standard money demand, and we have some money supply, real money supply, M over P, that was uh, set by the Fed. So let's go ahead and get our LM and IS equations. We'll start with LM, because that one's a, a little bit simpler in this case. We'll copy down our money demand. That's 0.25Y minus 0.5R. And then our real money supply is just uh, 5. And then we can... In some sense, this is that equation I wrote in blue is our LM equation, but it's kind of a mess. What we'd like to do so that we could plot it and, you know, sort of think about it um, in a nice way is, is rearrange it to the form R equals blah, blah, blah. So if we go ahead and do that, you can pause the video and, and verify this for yourself. You'll get 0.5Y uh, minus 10. So it slopes up like we'd expect. Now we'll move on to getting our IS curve. Hopefully you've been practicing this, so you're starting to get really good at it. We have our savings on the left equals investment on the right. That's our loanable funds equilibrium, and it lets us derive this um, IS curve. So we'll plug in for C and uh, I. We can't plug in for G because we said G is unknown, so we'll just leave the G floating around. And we get uh, Y minus 10 minus 0.5Y. There's no T, so we've already plugged in the 0 for T. Uh, and then minus G. We don't know G, so we can't plug in for it. And then for I, we have 15 minus R. And in some sense, again, like above, this is our IS equation, but it looks like a total mess. So what we'd like to do is rearrange it, get it into some nice form. And you can pause the video and do that for yourself. Uh, what you'll get is R equals 25 plus G minus 0.5Y. And it might be good at this point to pause and notice that G is basically the part of the intercept for this IS equation. So the bigger G gets, the higher the intercept for our IS equation is going to be. In effect, the higher G gets, the more it's going to shift our IS curve up. 
And in a previous video, we discussed how uh, to do comparative statics with increases in government spending, and this is consistent with that. That was the same conclusion we had before. So it looks like we're on the right track. Now we have an LM equation, we have an IS equation, and what we'd like to do is solve for the equilibrium. Let's solve for y and get y as a function of g. Uh, in previous videos, we, we, once we had is and lm, we'd solve for y and get an actual number. But since we don't know g here, we won't be able to get a final number. We'll just get some function that tells us, uh, you know, output as a function of g. Then we can plug in specific g's to get a specific number. Hopefully that makes sense. It'll become more concrete on the next slide. So I've copied down from the previous slide our uh, LM on the left and our IS on the right, and now we're going to be solving for equilibrium. So uh, let's see. We can move all the Ys to the left-hand side, and we get 0.5Y plus 0.5, so that's just Y. That's convenient. And we'll move all the numbers to the right-hand side, so we move the minus 10 over, and we get 35 plus G. And uh, wow, it turned out the algebra actually wasn't that difficult for solving this out. So our equilibrium is that y is going to be 35 plus g. The bigger g gets, the bigger y gets, and this really doesn't surprise us. We had that conclusion previously when we did comparative statics. What we want to now analyze is the g multiplier. So as a reminder, the g multiplier is defined as delta y, uh, so, whoops, got to erase. It's delta y over delta g. So it's basically the slope of this equation, and we sort of look at it, there's an implied slope here of 1. So our g multiplier is 1. And we also had a formula for the, for the g multiplier with the Keynesian cross. The Keynesian cross formula was, so I'll put kc here, in contrast would be g mult should be 1 over 1 minus mpc, and I meant to point it out earlier, but I forgot to. The MPC in our consumption function, if you, you know, sort of play the video back, you'll see that the MPC was 0.5 for the consumption function that we've been using. So for this particular example, the Keynesian cross would tell us we should expect a G multiplier of 1 over 1 minus 0.5, which is 1 over 0.5, which is 2. So the Keynesian cross tells us that the G multiplier should be 2, but in actual practice, we worked out the ISLMG multiplier for this example, and it turned out it was 1. So that conclusion, it turns out, is quite robust. The ISLMG multiplier, in general, is going to be smaller than the uh, Keynesian cross multiplier. And we, what we'd like to ask is, can we understand the economics of that? Why is it different? What is the ISLM model capturing and modeling that the Keynesian cross left out? So it turns out that it's actually the thing that the ISLM model allows us to see that the Keynesian cross left out is, is fairly simple. It's that the ISLM model attempts to model the interest rate. It's one of our two key uh, variables on our diagram, right? So if we had an ISLM diagram, we'd have Y as part of our focus, but also R as part of our focus. Whereas in the Keynesian cross, there was no notion of a real interest rate. We didn't even mention or try to model or care about this real interest rate. And by modeling the real interest rate, we open up the possibility of changes in government purchases influencing the interest rate, and as a result, having other downstream consequences. In particular, it causes what we call crowding out. So I've listed a chain that sort of goes step by step through this process of crowding out. What does crowding out mean? And it means that if you increase government purchases, you're going to shift the IS curve. And we, we saw on a previous slide that it shifts the IS curve up or to the right. You can think about it either way. I prefer to think of it as shifting it up. And because of that shift up, you move from a point like A to a point like B. So the interest rate goes up. And now we want to think about what did that higher interest rate do to investment? And as the chain shows, and I think you have pretty good intuition about by now, higher interest rates are going to lower uh, investment spending. Firms have to pay more to borrow. They don't want to pay such high interest to borrow, so they don't. And then they have to cut back on investment. So at the same time that government purchases are increasing output because they're increasing the G component and then potentially increasing the consumption component 
of, uh, of output, they're simultaneously lowering the investment component. So the overall net increase is not going to be as big as we might have predicted if we just completely ignored this investment part. Uh, pretty much everybody agrees that if you increase government purchases, you're going to increase output a little bit in the short term, but you probably won't increase it as much as maybe a naive analysis would predict because you wouldn't have factored in that you're increasing interest rates and those interest rates are crowding out investment. We can also see a little bit of this on the diagram in the sense that if we look at the movement from A to B, you might have thought the naive analysis would be that we shifted our IS curve to the right uh, like so, like the double-headed arrow shows, but the actual change in Y from A to B is much smaller than that shift in the IS curve. The delta Y is only, it looks like here, maybe half as big. Of course, that's just sort of not quantitatively specific. It's, it's just sort of like in, in this particular example, it's smaller, quite a bit smaller than the shift in the IS curve, and that reflects crowding out. You could think of the analysis as being we shift to the right, but then we move along that new IS curve up to point B. And as we move along that curve, the interest rate goes up and uh, output Y goes down. So our total increase in output isn't as big as the shift alone would have predicted. So hopefully this uh, video on the G multiplier revisited was useful in a couple ways. For starters, the conclusion is important. The conclusion that the G multiplier tends to be smaller than you might have uh, expected based on the Keynesian cross is important. It's important for policy analysis. A second important part was just getting this practice with ISLM, both drawing the diagrams like we've done here and doing the algebra like we did on previous slides and, and actually calculating that G multiplier. And then the third thing that, that was important is that we got to see how the ISLM model adds something new to our analysis. It goes beyond the Keynesian cross, and in particular, it goes beyond the Keynesian cross in the sense of incorporating the interest rate. It lets us get interesting dynamics like crowding out that we can analyze because we've enriched the model with new variables like the interest rate. Hopefully that was interesting. We're going to continue developing the ISLM model in a few more videos. So this isn't quite the end of the series, but we're, uh, we're getting pretty close. So thanks for keeping up with all of this. I know the ISLM models, uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a handful and it gets kind of hairy. Uh, but uh, now by now you're starting to really master it. So your, your hard work is paying off.